But usually I'm like, okay, I can move on. But he's there, but I can't. Okay, can we do that? Yeah, I'll go over So is it ready? Yes. Okay, great. Well, let me introduce myself. I'm Melanie Gowen, and I teach history at the University of Kentucky. I'm not originally from Kentucky. I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania. It's called home. It's so nice. So I came here, and the weather's much nicer. If you came from South Carolina, you had the opposite experience. But um, and so I do Kentucky history. I study U.S. 20th century women's history, healthcare history. And my first book was on the frontier nursing service. And like I said, this is kind of going back to an old friend here to talk about uh, Breckenridge and her work. And I'm a big fan of what she accomplished. Um, so you'll probably see that. Let me start with a couple of questions. So just to, to gauge your knowledge of the FNS, um, how many people have seen the PBS show called The Midwife, which is set in a different time and place. Has anyone seen that show? Um, it's set in East End of London, right after World War II. You've got nuns there and lay women riding bicycles to get to their patients. Uh, but some similarities. And in fact, the producers of that show have talked about creating an American version, which would be based on the Frontier Nursing Service. So I love that show. A big fan of it. I got to sit down with the producers a couple of years ago. I'm not sure what the status of that is, but I'm hoping something will come of it. Um, did any of you see the KET documentary that they, uh, I think, was about maybe last fall on the Frontier Nursing Service? It's an hour long piece. I encourage you to go and watch that uh, because you're going to see a lot of video footage, photos. It'll make it come to life. A little bit more. I have some photos, but I think you'll really enjoy after hearing and talking about the organization tonight to see that piece. Um, how many people you said you had a home birth with a midwife? How many people have used the services of a midwife? Anyone? Okay. You're you're in there? Mm -hmm. And your sister? Sister law. Sister in law mm -hmm. for nurses. Okay, but not a but not a separate mm -hmm. Okay. I had two aunts, two birth me. Uh-huh. My mother's okay. in history. There was a doctor came like, you know, 14 hours later. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, she's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Routine birth. That's how it happened, right? At all. That's, that's how I got with and his name. My aunts wanted daughters, so they got stunned, so they named me um, what they wanted for their daughter. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And that was a great pleasure for them, I'm sure. Um, no one's from Leslie County, right? Okay. Sometimes when I have given this talk in the past, I'll have someone who was from, or even was delivered by an FNS nurse to the wife. And so that's a really fun thing to see too. So you all, this is a new topic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. That's helpful for me to know. Um, Mary Breckenridge would love the fact that midwifery is. It has become part of the mainstream, I'd say, over the last what, 20 years or so. Uh, when my children were born, my oldest was 19, it was hard to find a midwife. Um, but you can see here figures, the most recent, that's 2019, about 14% of US births are attended by a certified nurse midwife, which is highly trained uh, 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 caregivers. But those numbers have been rising in recent years. Certain pockets of the United States, too, you can see where midwifery is much more popular and uh, it has a lot more, a uh, lot easier to find a midwife. But all states today, you can have uh, licensed, certified nurse midwives. And that's a big shame. And Breckenridge, she certainly. Uh, had a very different situation when she began her work. And I wanted to show this. Um, uh, maybe the escape. Uh, this is Breckenridge's certificate that the state of Kentucky gave her when she begins the Frontier Nursing Service, 1925. 
they didn't have any paperwork for her. They're like, okay, what do we do? We got to cross some stuff out. She, you know that she got certificate number one um, as a midwife licensed here in Kentucky. And they had to kind of, they changed it from a degree to a certificate of obstetrics from the state of to England, because that's where she had to go get her training, could not get midwifery training here in the United States. Uh, my favorite part though, you see here where, I think it's a circle, they had to cross out him. the him to put her in there. So this is this from their physician's certificate licensing and tried to make do the best they could with it. But she was going to be practicing midwifery. That's how new this was in the United States. It was just not heard of. It wasn't um, something that existed. Now, for since the dawn of time, people had had caregivers in birth. It was like your aunts, you know, maybe women that had given birth themselves, they had learned informally how to deliver babies. Um, and the community had often were called a granny woman that would come in and give birth and women would sort of crowd in the birthing room to help the new mother. Uh, so, you know, this had always gone on. But in the United States, at the turn of the 20th century, midwifery became something that was looked down on. It was seen as backwards. It was seen as dangerous. And the standard of care had been rapidly shifting toward physicians attending birth. Um, and births happening more and more in the hospital instead of the home. That was the trend that we were seeing in the United States through the teens and twenties. And so what Breckenridge was proposing really was a, a, a paradigm shift to think about women, midwives, continuing to deliver babies, but not lay midwives, not someone who had learned informally, but someone who had the training they needed to really do it as she saw right. And so combining nursing training with, 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 with midwifery training was her plan. And it was revolutionary for the time. Now, the first year nursing service is really fun to study because it is really colorful and dramatic as a topic. You've got, you got women on horses, women that are doing things that weren't expected of women at the time. Um, even the way they dressed, they had these kind of masculine military uniforms that they wore. So this was exciting. And talking about angels on horseback, Breckenridge was really able to uh, uh, make this a colorful story that Americans become eager to follow and hear about these nurses. They they learned their nicknames, they learned the names of their horses, and they followed their story. Um, the other thing that FNS does is it. Um, it capitalizes on an area that a lot of Americans were intrigued by at the turn of the century. In the 1920s, America was becoming a modern place, and Appalachia seemed like a throwback to a previous time, a lot of nostalgia about how people lived in this area of the country. You know, you have pictures like this people that lived like their ancestors lived. Now, not all of this was correct, but it was the impression Americans had of Appalachia as this really interesting, fascinating, quaint place with basket weaving and, and quilt making. Um, another thing that it, if people believed about this area was that it was a white area, that the, the residents had white skin and about 97% do in Lexington County where uh, Mary's going to start her work. Um, but the, the, the sense that this was a region filled with pure Anglo-Saxon people. And so Breckenridge also able to capitalize on that and get a lot of attention for her work. Um, but, it, but a really um, colorful story that she's able to tell about these nurses. And there you can see her on her horse back, very sitting on her horse, very regal. 
Um, a lot of people described her as a demanding general. She 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 didn't take anything from people. She gave the orders. People followed them. Um, so so she's part this tender caregiver, a woman caring for mothers and babies. But she's also got that sort of military presence about her that's really fascinating to me. So let me tell you a little bit about her story and her background uh, before I share some of what the ins and outs of doing nursing in this kind of environment look like. Um, you can see here she uh, was, as a young woman, like so many other women at the time, committed to becoming a wife and mother. That's what society said you should be. That's what she figured that she was going to do with her life. She planned to get married and have a household of children. Um, and, and her parents especially were focused on her marrying the right man and you know, probably a politician or a man who uh, was very influential and, and um, uh, as his helpmate, helping build his career. Now, Mary, for the most part, I did that. I, said, I should be a wife, I should be a mother. But there was some little part of her that always sought adventure. She wanted to go out there and see the world. She, she was educated in Europe uh, because she comes from a very well-known family. You know, how many people have heard the Breckenridge name before? Does that name? Maybe you've heard of some of her male relatives. Her, her grandfather had been vice president of the United States right at the beginning, uh, right before the Civil War. Um, he was the highest ranking military, uh, uh, the highest ranking U.S. politician to join the Confederacy. So she's, uh, she has Southern roots, Confederate roots that she's very committed to. Um, her father was a congressman. He was a diplomat. That's why she grew up overseas. She had male res relatives that were involved in education reform, religious, uh, religious leaders. The Breckenridge name seemed to fill the minds of the people, as someone said. So she comes from this political dynasty. So there's one part of her, I think, you know, she's grown up hearing what Breckenridges should be. They should be leaders. They should be out there in front of people, uh, improving the world around them. But that was hard as a young woman. How do you combine that Breckenridge name with the need to be a wife and mother? The two things at the time just don't go together. There's also a little part of her that is always a little adventurous. She loved to go out with her male relatives and go hunting. And she dreamed of climbing mountains. But she decided, okay, came a time, a crossroads in her life. She had to commit to one or the other. A life of adventure, a life of, uh, of a family. She chooses the conventional route. She gets married uh, and, and dreams of having children. Now, that was plan A. Plan A is not going to work out for Mary Breckenridge. And it's not going to work out twice. The first time, this, this time she got married, her husband, a year into the marriage, died. And appendicitis, very suddenly, this tragic, she was left a widow at the age of 24. So now what's she going to do? Well, at that point, she decided, hey, I think I'll go to nursing school. And I'm not sure at the time you went to nursing school, you probably had a lot of options. She doesn't see herself as having many options, right? Okay, what's she gonna do if she if she goes and studies something? What? There's no careers for women, really. She could maybe be a teacher. She decides, I'm gonna be a nurse. Which for a woman of her station, her background, that was kind of, I, yeah, it's a caregiving role, and women are supposed to do that. But you're going to get your hands dirty, and you're going to be doing things that a well-bred woman, woman usually isn't going to see. So this is a little bit of a risky decision on her part. But she goes to nursing school. She gets her nursing degree. Um, but she never practices because she meets another guy, and she decides, okay, now's my chance. I'm going to marry and have these children I dream of. She marries him. 
and she does have a child. She has two. One is it's a stillbirth, but her surviving child, uh, a boy nicknamed Brecky, for the Breckenridge name, uh, born in 1914, and she loves this child. She adores this child. Uh, she weighs and measures them constantly. She reads all the child rearing literature to know exactly what to feed him. Every every little detail in his life, she's overseeing. She dreams he's going to grow up to be a leader of men. But uh, just a couple of days after his fourth birthday, he he uh, gets ill. His digestion is upset. She's wondering what, what could be causing this. I didn't take him to the doctor. He's very ill. And they, they do surgery, open him up, and bring her into the operating room because she's a nurse to see where the trouble led. And he had a bowel obstruction. This is before you have antibiotics. He dies several days after that. I mean, this, if you can imagine someone being crushed. She just worshiped this child, really. I don't think that's an overstatement. And she would spend the rest of her life mourning him everywhere she went. She took a picture of the person she did, set it up by her bedside, and she traveled extensively. He dies 12 days after his death. She commits to go to Europe. 1918 is the year of his death, it was also the year where America's still involved in World War I. She is a nurse, she speaks French, she has skills to offer, and she needs to get out of where she's at. For one thing, because she's lost her son, the other is the marriage falling apart. This husband, the second one, Richard Thompson, turned out to be a philanderer who was having an affair with some of his students. He was a principal of a, a, a president of a girls university and so she's trying to get out of that situation she goes to europe to serve with the red well she's going to serve with the red cross she ends up serving with a private organization the american committee for devastated france um, as a nurse as a director of child hygiene and district nursing yeah this was the adventure she had always longed for um she is Traveling across the country, you can imagine her bouncing across France in a Jeep, going out there visiting communities that have been utterly devastated. Children are starving. They're trying to rebuild, and she's doing her part to make that happen. Now, she's learning some things when she's in France. Lessons that she's going to bring back that are going to shape the rest of her day. One thing she learns is that there is a different way of organizing medical care in Europe, especially in Britain. She's also traveling to Britain and she's seeing trained nurse midwives in action. And they do wonderful work. It's a great idea, she thinks. She also notices that they're organized in districts where they can serve small communities of people. They're really close to the people they know, the people in their district. They can offer exceptional care at very reasonable cost. And so she sees the, the benefits of this. Hey, this is a really great idea. The other thing she learns in France is that she can raise money. When she has these starving children, she's trying to feed, she's trying to rehabilitate them. She needs supplies, and she thinks, I need goats, and I know where I can get these goats. I'm going to write to the women back home. I'm going to tell these stories to these starving children, and I'm going to see if they'll send me money to sponsor a goat. And they do. They're so excited about this. She gets a ton of goats. She's able to dispense them fresh milk for children. This solves a lot of her problems. So she says, hey, if I raise money here, Maybe I can raise money later on, too. So these ideas start to percolate in her mind. 1921, she comes back to the United States. By that point, she's gotten divorced. Although she keeps the Breckenridge name, she actually takes the Breckenridge name. She calls herself Mrs. Breckenridge throughout her life, which would 
equate to being married to her father, the Breckenridge, as she would be Miss Breckenridge, but the Breckenridge name she knows is going to be very useful to her. There she is, and she looks in the 1920s. I like that photo. She kind of looks like a flapper there, I would think. She's got these ideas, decides that she wants to start a health service. Particularly, she's interested in rural Americans and the lack of health care in these areas. And especially, she's interested in mothers and babies. She wasn't able to put, save her own child, so maybe she can save uh, children uh, of other women. So she takes these ideas. Um, the, the concept of nurse midwifery, the concept of district care, uh, the concept of public funding, which is another part of the British system that she really likes. The government's chipping in money. Rural areas need a little help. And so she, she brings these ideas back and starts to look for where she's going to create this organization. Uh, where would be the best spot? And she, and she does this very strategically. She thinks, I want to create a demonstration. A demonstration of these new ideas that won't just be applied in this one community, but will be picked up by other people and copied all over the country, all over the world. She's dreaming big at this point. So she's thinking, I need to find a place where the conditions are the most challenging. Because that's then going to send the best message. You know, if it works here, it can work anywhere. So she starts by looking at Arkansas. That's where she had lived with when she had her husband and son. She had lived in the Ozark Mountains. Too many bad memories there. She focuses in on Kentucky. For one reason, she knows the Breckenridge name will carry a lot of weight there. And also, there are mountains. There are rural areas where people need good health care. So she zeroes in after a lot of study, a lot of riding around on horseback to get the lay of the land. She zeroes in in Leslie County, which you see there. 1925, she creates her organization, kicks it off in Frankfurt with a big rally, calls it the Kentucky Committee for Mothers and Babies. That was the Frontier Nursing Services original name. So you see there the, the, the very focused interest in mothers and babies. And there you can see um, what this is going to look like in action. So you've got women, trained nurse midwives. She can't find them in the United States, no schools here. So she goes to Britain, she goes to Scotland, she goes to New Zealand. She's getting women who are trained in this role from all over the world to come to Eastern Kentucky. Starts with a couple nurses, it's gonna grow quite quickly. And they're doing mostly home care. At first, they don't even have a hospital. They don't even have nursing centers at first. But you have these nurses going out on horseback to meet the people, to, to uh, start to build a relationship, to start to deliver the first babies in home, uh, as you see here. Now, this baby, this is actually a, a, a checkup, a well-child visit, we would call it today. But you got to remember, this is an area, an era when that kind of care isn't happening. Now, you said you had a home birth. I imagine you were seeing your midwife periodically before the baby was born and then periodically afterward. That kind of care, that's the standard today. In this period, you called the doctor when the time came, and that was pretty much it. But she'd say, no, we need, if we're going to give these kids the best start in life, we've got to checking with their mothers all through their pregnancy. Every two weeks up to the seventh month, I think it was, and then every week thereafter. That's probably more than you had. They're checking urine, they're checking blood pressure to, to determine if there's any problems developing. The goal is to have a normal 
pregnancy, and the nurse midwife then will come when the time comes. Um, and then after, she's going to show up every day for a while, and every week, until the kid is age five, the nurse tracking them, making sure they're they're gaining weight. Yeah, and, and you got to imagine here to do a home birth, home delivery. And this is a little, this picture is actually from the 1930s. Um, maybe by that point, it doesn't look like the, this home probably has electricity. Certainly in the 20s, they're not going into homes that have electricity or running water. There's not a telephone to call if you have problems. You have to bring all your own equipment. Having saddle bags, the nurses always had two saddle bags. They were packed at all times, ready to go. One would be for normal just check of wellness visits. The other, if you were going to be able to see and delivery. So, what are some of the things you'd have to bring with you? Well, like a rubber sheet to lay on the bed, basins. You may not even be able to find bowls. In this household, a, a little stove with sterno to heat the water, to sterilize equipment, to bring clamps to clamp the cord, um, drugs that you might need in case things go wrong. A little scale there. You can see that you hang the baby up there to, to see how much they weigh. All this equipment, you're bringing it with you into that home to do these visits. Um, so, so then it's, it's a lot of um, exertion. These these nurses are strong and tough, and um, uh, the midwifery saddlebag weighs forty eight pounds. You're carrying it maybe the rest of the way up the mountain to get to the house, and and just to get to the house, um, all the nurses uh, a rite of passage was your first calls that you made. And like I said, these are women that are coming from across the globe. They're not familiar with Eastern Kentucky. Someone told them, hey, you can go there and ride around on a horse and, and give care that way. And they're like, oh, I like horses. Sign me up. So they kind of feel like they've been dropped in this area. Um, and a lot of them didn't know what they were getting themselves into. So your first night call to imagine it's pitch black, you don't know where you're going, you don't have GPS, your phone does not tell you where you're going. You're on horseback, you may be fording across the river, you may be crossing some little rickety footbridge across the creek. You're hoping that the horse knows where he is going, picking its way up the mountain to get to this mother in labor. And of course, you know, time's a ticking, you don't want to get lost on the way there. So this is really terrifying. I can imagine, um, and when we were saying this, I don't know if I would have signed on for this. I, I don't think I'm that kind of thing here. Um, but these nurses delivering really high quality care. Two nurses stationed in each outpost centers as they start to appear spread out across the territory to make it so the nurses could in about an hour's time, an hour horseback ride, get to anyone living on their district. You can see here in the late 20s, the FNS built a hospital, a very small hospital, had 12 beds. But in case complications arose, there was a resident physician there uh, for the skilled specialized care in case that situation arose. Because the cost of place to Hyden, Hyden, Kentucky is um, the, the base of operation for the Freckin Nursing Service. One reason Breckenridge picked it was it was way off the beaten path. It took 25 miles on horseback to get to a rail station, to get to Hazard where there was trained medical care. So this was bringing the doctor much closer to people. Before 1928, those first three years, the FNS was taking people to hazard and it's uh, it very strenuous. So the, the hospital, Mary also built her home in uh, Leslie County, Wendover was the name. And you can go visit now. It's been turned into a bed and breakfast 
um, the Frontier Nursing Service has moved its operations recently out of Leslie County and moved it to for sale right outside of Lexington. But Wendover is still going and so it's a wonderful and very, very good food if you, if you stay there. Uh, but her nurses uh, and the exertion that this takes, um, and, and, you know, and they're doing normal district work, plus then maybe they have several midwifery calls in the week. And once the nurse got there on site, they stayed until that baby was born. It could be a day, it could be 36 hours, it could be 48 hours. They were going to stay until the baby came. But they're doing other work too. They're uh, they're also doing a lot of preventative care in other ways, giving vaccines, um, teaching people about sanitation, how to screen their windows to keep flies from coming in, uh, and then emergency care. So maybe someone is bitten by a snake. Or the danger to the nurses is the danger to anyone. And so they have their um, anti-venomous venom uh, uh, drugs that they're ready to deliver. They are treating if someone is a gunshot wound. They're treating that if they're crushed by a log in a logging accident or a mining accident, whatever it is, the nurses, they're ready to deliver emergency care. Now, I said they had uh, all this equipment in their saddlebags. They also have one other really important thing. Um, they call it their medical routine. And as a nurse, I know there's certain limits to what you can do. Prescribe, you can define your prescription uh, hours, um, certain drugs you can't administer. So, so that's a problem here. Breckenridge's solution was to come up with standing orders in the form of a guidebook. What do you do in this situation? What do you do if there's a gunshot wound? Well, a nurse is probably not ideally the best person to treat that, but they're better than Joe over here. And so they have to be ready to act. And that medical routine is written by doctors, some of them in Lexington across the state of Kentucky, supporters of the FNS. They wrote down exactly what you do in every situation, what drug you give, right? They were practicing medicine. Now, we don't like to say that because doctors might get a little upset by that. They kind of kept it quiet, but that's what they're doing. I mean, they're even practicing veterinary medicine when someone brings their cow and says, can you help fix my cow? They're doing whatever they can. Uh, but their medical routine was legally what was going to hopefully protect them from charges that they were overstepping their bounds as nurses. No matter the weather, if the father came to the nurse, she was going to go with him. It didn't matter if it was storming, if there was a flood, she killed a boat. Uh, you did whatever it took to get there. Here, a gunshot victim. You know how you make a stretcher when you don't have one? You have two guys take their coats off, you find some poles, you run the poles through the arms of the coats, and you're able to make a makeshift stretcher. And then you start in teams. You carry the person down the mountain, and this person goes for. 15 minutes and then you switch and, and bring them a couple miles that way. So you may do. Funding, big important issue. How do you pay for this? Well, Breckenridge at first thought, this is a great idea. Everyone's going to support this, right? The federal government's going to step up. They pay for education. Of course, they're going to want to pay for health care. Well, good news work out that way. She didn't get foundation support. She got a little, but they don't write her a blank check either. So she has to go and work her magic and and use her connections at Breckenridge Maine. So she goes out and hits the pavement telling the story. She goes from northern city to northern city, finding the most influential people in each city. What are the names? Who's the person? Who's the person who knows everyone and has their finger involved in every project? I want them on board. And they're going to 
post me and tell this and let me tell the story. And that's what she did. And the money starts to pour in very quickly. Within just a couple of years, she's raising over a hundred thousand dollars a year. And then when she was 26, when she was 27, a hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money. Names like the Ford family. They're writing a check every year. They love the Central American service and what it stands for. They're sending Jeeps when Jeeps start to replace the horses. And they're naming them after Ford family members. Henrietta was one of their, their Jeeps named for Henry Ford. Um, Kellogg's, all these names, big name people sending checks. The funding. That is largely Dr. Richard's piece, and it's exhausting. The number of miles she puts uh, on, on her horses, on her body, is incredible. So the FNS looks for Breckenridge looks for stories that she can tell over and over, stories that she can get a lot of mileage out of. And so I'll tell you, here's one of these stories. Uh, the first nurse to die in service. A woman named Nancy O'Driscoll. She was from Ireland. She had bright red hair. She never liked to wear her cap. She wanted her curls flying free. Uh, 1931, she is, she's been only working for the FNS for a couple of months, but apparently she was well loved, um, kind of a spunky personality. Here's her clinic. The, uh, the women and neighbors that she worked with, they loved her. And she was completely committed to her work. To the point that when she was ill and sick one day, she ignored it. I got to get through my rounds. I got people to see. We'll worry about that later. And she grew more and more ill. And finally, her appendix burst. That was the problem. And by that point, it was too late. Her colleagues rallied around her. They gave her everything that modern medicine at the time could throw at this. Couldn't save her. And she dies. And tributes to her poor inn. This is from the Lexington newspaper um, talking about you know, no soldier on the field of battle really playing up her bravery, commitment to her patients. She said the nurse died in war for the preservation of the race. So you get a taste of the publicity that Breckenridge loved and, and used to raise money. Um, there's her tombstone. She's buried in Lexington. But they had to get her down from the mountain. And so they asked the people in her district to help the men came out a huge parade of people following the casket. Um, her horse with the stirrups turned backwards um, to show the riderless horse. It's this very solemn uh, procession down the mountain. But Nancy O'Driscoll then for years has talked about this is the kind of commitment FNS nurses have to their patients. And she becomes a wonderful uh, story for them to share. 1929, by that, just four years, the FNS has been in, uh, in operation. 25 nurse midwives gone from all parts of the world, and most of Europe. Uh, six clinics, 700 square miles, they're covering with 10,000 patients. They're seeing these people um, on a yearly basis. And a record for delivering babies that was top in this era. If you looked at American statistics, uh, mortality rates, mothers, babies, America's rates were pretty bad if you compared us to a lot of countries. The FNS much, much better than national results. And you know, Breckenridge said, hey, we're, we're working on this some of the most extraordinary conditions. This is a model that other people should copy. And the FNS 
1929, they're ready to go out there and start planning satellite organizations. You don't know what's going to interfere. What's coming up? Yeah, that's going to interfere. But before that, what happens in 1929? Stock market. Stock market crashes. Yeah, the Great Depression begins. All these people that have been writing her checks, they're like, oh, okay, you know, I'll still help, but I'm not going to give as much as I once did. I got other things I got to do. She tries to uh, host uh, uh, cruises. People can go on an SNS cruise to exotic locations. Well, that doesn't even work. She's really struggling, has to cut a bunch of nurses, cut down their territory, they kind of do what they can to survive, but they do survive the 30s, and then the war comes. And the war is going to be a really big problem. Anyone want to reason out why is the war such a big problem here? Just thinking about the work they're doing and how they're doing it, where their nurses are coming from. Um, I can't remember if there were any. German nurses. I don't think they had had any from Germany, but now they can't get any from Britain. And those that are here, they want to go home to help in the war effort. And so there's this huge exit of nurses. So Breckner says, okay, I've always said part of the goal is to create a school to train nurse midwives. Now's the moment we're going to have is do or die. And she opens a school, a midwifery school in 1939, um, in the wake of the war developing. And that's actually going to be part of the service's biggest influence, uh, training professionals. A lot of people are just coming visiting international guests. You can see learning from the FNS as Mary Breckenridge later in her life, hoping that they'll take her ideas and run with it. And they have. I mean, it's a model that has really worked. It's very efficient, cost effective, save doctors for situations where you really need a doctor, but nurse midwives can provide the bulk of routine care. There you see at the very end of Breckenridge's life, she lives, uh, she was in her early 80s, 1965. She Died. She worked till the day before she died. She was in her bed. That's where she did most of her work. I forgot to say the 1930s, another thing that's hard for the service besides the Great Depression, Breckenridge was thrown from a horse and she broke several vertebrae in her back and she was in excruciating pain for the rest of her life. She had to wear cement and had to put the word on the bed and she kind of propped herself up a lot trying to alleviate some of the pain. But she didn't let it stop her. That's why I'm so impressed with her. I, you know, I'm a huge fan. Raises $10 million. And a huge endowment that the FNS still to this day is using to serve people, rural people across the world, training uh, new practitioners. Uh, by the time she dies, 58,000 patients. 14,500 babies and continuing that that record for very low mortality rates. Um, so it's much safer for women um, than, than the average woman across the country. And then Frontier Nursing University, you see there their symbol. That's really how the Frontier Nursing Service today continues its legacy. Um, they're training certified nurse midwives, they're training training nurse practitioners, all of these, uh, I kind of call it a tiered healthcare system, these middle tiers uh, where you don't quite need a doctor's care. Um, but a lot out there, I think, that we can learn from today. She really wanted healthcare to be publicly funded, that everyone had the right to get healthcare. Um, that didn't exactly work out, but she certainly did her part to make sure people who wouldn't have care otherwise were getting it. Uh, questions or you know? 
not really a question, but over the last several years, I personally prefer a nurse practitioner over a physician. Yeah, a nurse practitioner will sit down and, and look at you and listen to you and ask perfect questions and listen to your answers. And take more time. That's the yeah. first yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I, you know, well, you'll have to see the nurse practitioner. Fine, sign me up. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good to me. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, bills to insurance less and better care. And you know, working with people would say, yeah, these, these caregivers know their patients. You're know, not just a number. This is better. your neighbor. This is your friend. This is someone you know. Because I worked two years at the nursing home. And I know that the nurse aides, when you handle the patients, they were there with the patients. Well, we call them residents, you know, our partners. But they yeah. knew that person. And they could tell when there was a change in their health. And uh, yeah, the, the, where the doctors were there and couldn't see it, and even the RNs could not see it because they worked directly with the patients. Yeah. So, you know, you know when something's different from right day to day. Yeah. And when you see them every day and you work with them every day, you, you know, we, I know we had one patient on there that. Sometimes she was just as sweet as she could be, but there were times when she was kind of big. And I, this is not like her at all. And they discovered she was uh, having little small ticks. Because mm -hmm. yeah. it was, you know, messing around that. And her daughter was there too. Her, her daughter was mentally challenged. And uh, she came in to talk to her daughter. And, uh, but she, you know, she said, well, she's going, I'm going to die before she is, so I want you to be sure to take care of her. But if you want to have that right, because of the family, and you have so many. But the personality change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then you have that big one. Yeah. But you do, you see the difference in the people. I'm curious.
some of those problems with the same for parents midwives who who you know before to do um malpractice insurance you're delivering babies expensive because there's a good big risk there and so so you have that also but I think you know the, the carryover where for, for so long midwives were not seen as the skilled practitioners that she's talking about here they're seen as someone who just you know like okay there's no one around who's going to deliver the baby and you know they kind of start working that way and and, and Blackbridge to a certain extent really discredits grand midwives she goes out there and studies the situation before she starts and takes really careful notes and she interviews all these women who've been working as midwives and she to a certain extent i think it's just in their words she wants to be able to show how terrible things are before she comes in from the end the rescue well she she she, she took down all these notes and she was a big fan of numbers and proving that with data um, her success she never published the numbers of how many Deaths, uh, you know, what was the infant mortality rate before her nurses started practicing? It's like that information disappeared. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think probably they were more successful than she wanted to admit. And she needed to be able to show, hey, my ideas are great ideas, and that she should be given care. So, what is your strength or stamina to get out there and, and face the world? And, you know, I could. Oh, I wonder that too. I mean, I you know, I think it's really inspiring and encouraging. It was like an Amelia airport, I mean, and then a little Roosevelt. Yeah. So and she waited people. that young yeah. week and well, she goes, Well, she doesn't start this work so she can yeah. afford it. So, yeah. 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 I can imagine why I'm <laughs> <laughs> I used to, but not <laughs> anymore. Yeah. When she, when she fell off, she couldn't, she couldn't make it out. Mm -hmm. And that's what she did. 60 years ago. So, yeah, the stamina, I think, I think a lot of it is she grew up being told that a breath of air is a great thing, and you have to live up to that name. I think part of it, I think. She has such deep grief, she said. And it's a way to escape. That is different. You know, and I didn't understand that when I started this book project. That was, that was before I had kids. And I understand it now on a different level. Mm -hmm. But I think she's trying to. Driven by that grief. But it, it, it was, it's really notable that she did see a need and she pursued it and uh, pushed it yeah. to where that she does. did it work. You know, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to have this regardless of how you feel or what you do, we're going to dig in there and get it. Yeah. And she was an exceptional leader. You know, when you mm -hmm. talk about kind of models of leadership skills. She would be one, I think, people study. And I said she had kind of that presence of a commanding officer. People really wanted to please Mrs. Breckenridge. And so it's not just her by her sheer willpower making this happen. She's able to mobilize so many people, donors, nurses, patients themselves to buy in. And they, they, at first, they're really reluctant. These nurses are coming in, they don't have speak like we do, you know, they, it's that foreign. <laughs> and <laughs> if there were rumors, you know, like these nurses are trying to tr change the babies into bears, the baby boys into bears, and they're going to sterilize children. And all these rumors were flying early on. But about five years in, she's won them over too. And there's a deep and abiding affection for Mrs. Breckman. And that's why there's so much that the FNS has pulled out and gone to for sale 
And there was a bunch of it in the news here where it for the last couple of years. They even put this stained glass window that Leslie was putting the chapel there in Leslie County. It's like a 17th century stained glass window. Is there anything at all in, in what you have picked up to write the book and everything that how her parents felt for her? Yeah, well, so by the time she starts the FNS, her mother has died. Her father came to live with her in Leslie County uh, for about a year. He died then. Um, her parents, though, didn't want her to get an education. They thought she should get married. She had a cousin who was very well educated for a young woman and really started the social work profession. So it is the right word. And so Mary's coming after her. She's like, Yeah, I want to do that too. And her parents are like, No, you're not going to do it. No, that's not that doesn't seem like that doesn't make you a lady. Right. But I think, you know, and her mother, I guess, was more than one of the ideas to follow the domestic path. Her father then, either because, you know, she tried twice. I mean, what are you going to do now? <laughs> but he he was supportive of her work toward the end of his life. Well, if I'm not mistaken, her mother had a stimulation inheritance that she would not inherit if she was going to keep it for her attorney. Yeah. And finally, she reminded well, yeah, and I uh, and um, she was dead by that time. So well, I mean, did she yeah. did she run before she died? I you know, I don't. Know. That's a good question. I, think yeah, I don't think there was any stipulation in the will, was there? Uh huh. Was there? Yes. Okay. And the consequence was that Mary then stopped growing her salary. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she gave all of she personally. Yeah, that's right. I should have yeah. said that. And then her mother, yeah, yeah, her mother would learn of her money. Finally, put her in the mm -hmm. you know, very long, but Yeah. Hey, you know, and Mary didn't get along with her sister. The women in her family they were very hard on her. Yeah. You know, and you know, as far as her drive, it's interesting that Clatter at the beginning says the same thing. She went up to the husband's mother. She said, no, I would have thought that her relationship with the cloister, well, she had a yeah. was it? She had a spiritual God, she said. And they corresponded. Yes. Yeah, the anchors. So they corresponded deeply. Do you ever read any of that correspondence? Yes. Yeah, she saw yeah. At least that's what I, you know, certainly first and foremost is it. Guaranteed. But you're right, when you get through that pain of every day, honestly, as this nun yeah. praying for her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think just mm -hmm. knowing that she had that. Well, she says several times that whenever I wanted to abandon her, it became too much. Mm -hmm. You know, my mind would return to the anchorettes and her always saying, You're doing God's work, you're doing He's God's never work. Never gonna let you, you know. Mm -hmm. you want, yeah. yeah. I know she was in going to look in where was she? She was in that London. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she had met her when he uh Breckenridge does her I forgot to mention that she you know has to go and train a midwife for stuff. So mm -hmm. she is a nurse, she's also trained as a midwife. And when she was studying in London, she met um Adam Passion. Mm -hmm. And 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 you know, Breckenridge didn't talk a lot about the religious state. You know, two things you don't talk about politics and religion, and certainly if you're trying to court donors, you kind of who knows what else she was involved with. But she was deeply spiritual. Deeply. Yeah. She also went through that period where she was going to seances and yeah. trying to talk to her son, which yeah. is very popular. Yeah, spiritualism um, was popular. Spiritualism. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to say it. No, mm -hmm. yeah. And this is, <laughs> I, I didn't recognize you. And oh, really? Did, did, did Scott plays Mary Cracker. She became homeless in the night. Well, I did a Chicago yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I know. I'm excited to come and hear this. Yeah. Yeah.
Yes, Melanie, I, and I have gone down a long road with with Mary. Trying to understand well, you really to become her. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. It's not easy. I'll yeah. go, I'm going to say the absolute. <laughs> well, she's very complicated, and yeah. one of the things that we talked about for a long time is just not as much as her privacy makes it very difficult to imagine her. But I feel very, I mean, I just feel very convicted. You know, I feel very convicted. One of the things I do is I do go and serve as a standardized patient. After settings. Oh, so I do, oh, really? Yes, ma'am. I do, I do birth and so forth. And I what? That is unseemly. Did you ever see your grandmother have a baby? Right? And the, but otherwise, the faculty were doing them. And they said, oh, no, please. It isn't better. And then, of course, they know that I play her. Yeah. And so the nursing is just not. And now, of course, they have an international body. These women are extraordinary. I, it's mm -hmm. it's thrilling to me, and then to feel that I'm part of doing her work. Yeah, that is really cool. Yeah, yeah it's a great thing. What do you think about the Lego? Ah, uh, that's a big mess, isn't it? Well, what I really think about the Lego, I have been also just asked about. I think that. Uh, you know, the bottom line is that these people walk to the university. The part of the university body. And Mary built the chapel there. I think it has enormous significance to people of her region and that they're free to. Yeah. They needed to go together. It was also privately owned by the family. And so it wasn't the university. And that's the, I, what I think about the window is that I think the university got blamed for something. A wrecking rich family, and it was given to her by family. Members. Yeah, that's yes. right. And so, and there are also trustees of the university. So, I think it's a very painful decision all the way around, except for the wrecking rich family wanted their way. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the people of the town, who I think was the town, has a whole wide range of people, but the window was also. You know that many of the midwives would come and make very daily, as you know, and so I think institutionally babies were too long. I I don't know. Yeah, I hate seeing it out of the set. So I I didn't know if they were real or not. But anyway, if it ever breaks, we'll know the various. You know, it's, 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 uh, I don't, I, I'm sorry because I'm thinking out loud. I, yeah. So, but obviously, I don't have a specific opinion about the one that I think it was something that could also be seasoned by to blow up confidence. Yeah. And the reality is, Going to get high quality health care mm -hmm. in a technological age and have the equipment we need and have the accessibility and train these young women to go all over the world. Mm -hmm. Or for sentimental reasons, are you going to maintain historic buildings which have enormous meaning to every single person involved? Mm -hmm. Myself, yourself, the nurses, university. What is the priority? And so the window is way down on that way. Babies are being born and so forth. And those nurses have come out of frontier during the pandemic. Ah, uh, extraordinary. They're like these women that we've been talking about. And I get very emotional because I go out and have to go to campus and to meet them. These are extraordinary. Yeah. And then I didn't know Mary herself served during the 19th century. Our, uh, 1918 yeah. pandemic. She was in the sea. She couldn't get to the yeah. Well, that's a great time. I love women. They handed out masks and taught yeah. them proper hand hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's just, and we had, we had no cases. We gave out masks and taught them how to wash their hands. And you know, it was right when people were thinking. She's so 
problems. Yeah, that's but that's really but it's very tough to do. And I but if you turn around it, you know, driving out there and there are still no guardrails. And when the tech companies came in yeah. recently, to try to put a lead cable, they had to use fuels. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Just like yeah. they did. Yeah. It's when so Mary cool. built yeah. that hospital, they hauled that stuff up by oh. mule team. Yeah. And I'm telling you, 21st century, you know, Silicon Valley guy showed up like, oh, we're just going to put in certain power. Oh, we're going to. Well, you're you're gonna need you some mules. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Yeah. So you know, I I do. I, I obviously they help their systems too. Well, but people. Right. But I'm kind of missed out. Well, goodness, the people are. Yeah. I mean, I'm gonna tell one more story. Yeah. Christmas at one of the people hadn't come on time to do their Christmas, and Melody <laughs> could not. There's no way to paint a picture of what Mary needs in that video. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because these are people who no one yeah, they had not they had no one to care for them. This woman came, she helped them, she never left. Yeah. And when I play after as we perform and I do after the Christmas, the same image <laughs> we intermarried yeah. in the way back. But I said I heard the first one. I don't say like that to Mary. I say <laughs> in, in, in her name, in her name, how, yeah. in her name, how much to be remembered. Yeah. Say thank you. But this is more than just a Let's all be here. Let's all be here. This woman's absolutely extraordinary. It's been a long time with Mary. Mm -hmm. like, my children think that she's like, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she's like this long one. Well, and you run all 463 of those five. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. But she destroyed a lot too. She, she died. Yeah, yeah. There would have been more. There yeah. would have been more. There would have been more. Well, you know, the only person here I know is Dave. So, mm -hmm. oh, good. 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 I'm Sarah. I'm the programming librarian. Okay, I, I recognize you, but I didn't know what you 